It seems that nobody wants to work anymore these days. Get your f***ing up and work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. But who can blame them? Work sucks. But the people most enthusiastic about the good old Protestant work ethic seem to be those who never had tried a day of conventional labor, neither have they depended on exploitative wages for survival. What a coincidence! First of all, the Stalinism and the terror of Stalinism in the 1930s uh, uh, absolutely discredited the utopia, uh, the, the, the socialist uh, utopia. After 68, uh, the, the gender policy became to be more conservative than at the beginning. And also like the cultural notion of women as a carer became to be more important. Certainly machines are not going to take our job. That's, I mean, they may take one job, but that would mean that we have to learn uh, to do another job. Um, I think the workers, they have largely achieved what they fought for a century ago. And in terms of the work time, so the, of course, the eight hour work week, um, work day. We both want an eight hour work week. Let's be honest, that's the amount of work we want to do a week. <laughs> Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine and Display Euro production. We are a team of writers, designers, editors and producers who work very hard in the pixel mines and joke factories to present you with European content in 15 different languages. This May Day episode is dedicated to all the workers out there craving proper wages and less churn and burn. I'm your host, Reka Kingapop, and just like our guests, I too juggle many responsibilities. I am the editor-in-chief of Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show, and a co-founder of the Display Europe platform. I'm also a mother, a journalist, and a comedian. Now, since none of these provide me with a wage whose good part I wouldn't have to spend on rent and childcare, I'm also a part-time entrepreneur, a hobby gardener, a household fermentation expert, a grocery coupon aficionado, and altogether, a professional cheapskate. And if you haven't guessed it yet, today's topic is about labor. So whether you're enjoying the program from work, we don't judge, or the comfort of your own home, you can sit back and relax as we complain about the increasingly horrible ways of making a living. You can watch this show in a video format or listen to it in a podcast format on Display Europe or wherever you find your podcasts and videos. If you're watching on YouTube, first of all, why? Second of all, do subscribe and ring the little bell icon so you get the notifications before you head on over to displayeurope.eu to explore content across 15 European languages on culture, politics, community, and more without abusing your user data. From scholarship, it seems that humans were never really meant to work. Well, not as much as we do now anyways. Marshall Salient suggests that at some point in time, three hours per day used to be enough for people to survive. So whose idea was it to go for eight, 12, or even more hours? It's obscene if you ask me. Now, I don't want to be the person who blames everything on the Industrial Revolution, but uh, it's the Industrial Revolution's fault. Separating our lives into work and non-work finds its origins there, radically altering the way we live and how we organize our lives. The eight-hour workday isn't some kind of God-given natural truth either. It's a result of a long and bloody struggle for labor rights, where throughout decades people died so we can have paid sick leave. So don't reply to emails and don't go peeling potatoes at the school canteen, but quote Rosa Luxemburg and stay home resting as long as you can. The Haymarket Square riots in Chicago on the 1st of May in 1886 was the deadline that workers' unions set for the general strike. Carrying the slogan, eight hours of work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what you will, the peaceful rally resulted in bloodshed between workers and law enforcement. This is what we mark by celebrating Labor Day on May Day in Europe, and we commemorate this heroic struggle with beer, sausages, and amusement parks, because historical memory has its quirks. Most countries in the EU recognize May Day as an official holiday, except for Denmark and the Netherlands. <coughs> Protestants! Truth be told, workers' representation has been withering in the past few decades worldwide. Formerly self-explanatory labor protections have been rolled back all over Europe, 
And some states in the U.S. have even legalized child labor again. In the richest country on earth. Neoliberalism has done a number on labor unions, but of course it didn't help that the Soviet experiment abused the workers' cause to build a horrific authoritarian empire, as one does. The gig economy has been undermining traditional employment for a long time, but COVID lockdowns exacerbated this. It also left billions of people who did not have the privilege to work from home or to work at all, so they had to deal with the tragic health consequences of the virus on their own. Remember when we were complaining about Zoom headaches? That's when meat processing plant workers were dying. Young people in the EU were among the hardest hit populations by the pandemic, experiencing job loss, financial instability, and mental health issues. In 2020, the EU witnessed a 2.6% drop in youth employment, and it's still yet recovering. This effect was worst in Portugal, Bulgaria, Latvia, Czechia, and Poland. So an emerging generation of skeptics are asking the question, what are we even supposed to be working for? Moreover, with the nature of work drastically changing since the pandemic, Gen Z and millennials find themselves working much more than their fellow boomers in comparable positions used to, and for much less. One research shows that Gen Z are less likely to seek promotions because they don't want to work overtime and are less likely to stick with an unsatisfactory workplace, especially when they have fewer family obligations than previous generations did at the same time. This makes them seem more entitled and less desirable to many employers who deem them unprepared for the workforce. The thing is, this generation seems to prioritize not working, and I for one get it. But it's not like Gen Z invented this trend. Almost two centuries ago, Marx and Engels promised us a world in which machines take up boring and tiring jobs, and we would gradually revert to a life of some little work and a whole lot of laying about. So, where is my promised leisure time? I think I'm gonna stop working now. Bye. No, just kidding, the show must go on. I still didn't even get into gendered and racialized aspects of work. Women remain underrepresented in the labor market with care responsibilities unpaid and unrecognized in most places. In 2022, the European Commission presented the European Care Strategy, which promises to support informal carers and impose higher standards for care workers. Now, when it comes to care work as a profession, the main demographic is often migrant women who are already the highest target for trafficking and labor exploitation. There is a suffocating shortage of care workers all across Europe, yet migration policies are becoming more and more exclusionary. And if it seems like it makes no sense to want to get rid of the people we desperately need, it's probably because it really makes no sense whatsoever. So what's the point? We have our guests here to hopefully answer. Marina Tverdostup is an economist at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies and a country expert for Estonia. Her research interests cover diverse labor market issues, including gender inequalities, labor mobility, and immigrants integration. Historical context is important, and we have Peter Chunderlich to fill us in. He is a historian at the Utrecht Lorand University in Budapest and a research fellow at the Institute of Political History in Budapest. His areas of interest include left-wing radical movements, the memory of the Soviet Republic, and the 19th to 20th century social histories. He joins us online. Petra Hlavatskova is a Milena Jasenska journalism fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna, researching the paradoxical liberation of women under socialism through the examples of female architects in Czechoslovakia. Let's start with you, Peter. You're the historian. Give us a bit of a scope of what is the volume of the history of the labor movement? How long are we talking? What like approximate achievements are we talking when we are referring to the glorious and infamous history of the international workers' movement? We can talk about uh, the labor movement after the birth of the working class. And this working class uh, uh, was created by the Industrial Revolution. I don't want to be the person who blames everything on the Industrial Revolution, but uh, it's the Industrial Revolution's fault. And Eric Hobsbawm, the so-called last Marxist great historian 
wrote an excellent book in, in 1962 about uh, the Age of Revolution, uh, which um, introduced uh, the readers in the history, uh, both in the Industrial Revolution and uh, both in the political revolution. And uh, this uh, working class started to organize uh, itself in the 1830s in England, in the first industrial countries. This was the so-called Chartist movement. And uh, later in the 1840s, uh, the working conditions were so bad, uh, so unfair, that uh, um, a, some kind of uh, uh, revolution uh, became on the horizon. And uh, actually, it was a political revolution in 1848, when uh, the, the different uh, uh, and various revolutions of the European countries, including the Hungarian one, has a, a some kind of socialist uh, aspect. But uh, organization of the labor movement internationally was started by 1864, when the first international uh, was, was launched. This uh, first uh, uh, international was dissolved, and uh, we must uh, continue um, the launch of the second international which was uh, um, founded in 1860, uh, 1886. And um, it was uh, the year when uh, uh, it was a famous clash in Chicago. So basically we are talking about like a brutal 200 netto, 150 years of history. And uh, we are referring to the Haymarket Affair in 1886, uh, which was, uh, the goal of which was the eight-hour workday. So the eight-hour workday is being contested on multiple fronts in some uh, sort of happier and luckier situations um, with work time reduction, and in other situations by way expanding standard work times beyond this. Uh, for instance, in the hospitality industry, the, uh, the working days tend to be much, much longer. So the eight-hour workday is not really written in stone, but it is a 150-year-old uh, demand. So let's ask our economist, let's ask Marina about what is the general situation with, uh, with labor rights and regulations uh, within Europe. Labor regulations, they are very diverse across the globe still. And if we talk about the, like the, the EU um, context, then certainly we are, um, I think the workers, they have largely achieved what they fought for a century ago. And in terms of the work time, so the, of course, the eight hour work week, um, work day. We both want an eight hour eight work, hour week. work week. Let's exactly. be honest. <laughs> That's the amount of work we want to do a week. And we would be so efficient, yeah. believe me. Absolutely. No, the deep work, you know, the deep work is. Yes. Um, yeah, but in terms of the work time, certainly work eight hours, um, work, way, work day. And uh, all the rights concerning, the, you know, the, the work stability, the work, uh, the, the protection of workers. Um, on general, the EU, EU level, uh, it is there. But of course, if you look deeper into each and every single country, you have so much diversity. And of course, the diversity, it really comes from the state, firstly, from the overall state regulations, right, what is fixed by the governments. But it also largely comes from the labor unions, because that was really my experience uh, when I moved from Estonia to Austria, is that here the labor, uh, the labor unions are much stronger. And uh, they really have a right to, you know, to talk to the employers and to really protect the workers. And in that respect, they give so much more. Um, I think they are still doing, at least in Austrian context, they still do a very good job in protecting people, protecting from uh, unfair work conditions in terms of uh, overworking, in terms of unfair, uh, unfair uh, wages and, and things like that. But for sure, there is still a way to go because especially when we talk about things like uh, precarious employment, when we talk about the marginal jobs, when we talk about the uh, fixed term contract with the wage way below the market wage. So it is still there and it was um, sadly the legacy, it is still sadly a legacy of the COVID crisis that the marginal and precarious employment is still in the, there, it's still on the, on the rise. And um, yeah, so in that respect, the legislation can go further in terms of protecting workers in the most uh, unprotected in the most unstable jobs. Hey Europeans, or those living in Europe, or anyone else around the world who's interested in Europe, 
Do you want to meet someone who lives in a different country and also thinks differently from you to talk about issues that don't stop at borders? You know, like migration, climate change, social values, and where we want our future to go? Then you might be interested in participating in Europe Talks, a space that encourages open dialogue between people and institutions who come together to find common ground and form strong opinions about the most important issues today. You can sign up on the link below. I think it's important to, to point out that natural improvements like a two-day weekend, for instance, are not a given for a lot of people now, but are actually a very recent uh, development, a couple decades old altogether. And when we are talking about regular employment as opposed to everything else, that is also something that many, many movements across a lot of countries had fought for so that you would have a legal status, your employer would be obligated to provide you with a bunch of things. These are huge achievements, many of them being chipped away. And the, the sort of American uh, expression for this and the hip expression for certain forms of precarious employment is the gig economy. But precarious employment in terms of not having a legal status, not having insurance and protections has always been with us, but it has also legally gained a lot of ground. On the one hand, you could really see it as a sort of legal loophole which gives uh, more rights to employers. You know, they really give them the rights to, uh, to have cheap labor. Uh, unprotected in the sense that you can fire a person whenever you want, you are not obliged to give any other, you know, um, like you, you are obliged to give the very, very basic in terms of the social benefits. But in terms of the wages, you can pay less, or you can fire whenever you want. And in that respect, it is a bit of the legal loophole, as, as I see it, because uh, this is an area which certainly has to be regulated. And I think in some countries, you already have a movement, movement towards having more control over, uh, over those precarious types of jobs. I can't imagine the uh, economy without this type of the jobs, but certainly we have, uh, I would say that the majority of p people working on the precarious jobs, uh, they are forced to do that. So they would actually want to switch to more stable contracts. There is this very strong path dependence in the sense that if you've been working on a marginal job for some years, your chances to get a permanent job are getting much lower. During the COVID crisis, many people switched from their regular contracts to the, so those uh, fixed uh, short-term contracts, uh, marginal contracts under those different job protection schemes. And then the schemes were lifted, the COVID crisis was over, but the, you know, the marginal jobs, they stayed there and people keep working under those uh, conditions. I would like to draw attention to a, a sort of linguistic fact, and that is the ger in the German expression, which has its Hungarian mirror, that's Arbeitgeber or Munkado, that is the person who so it implies that they present you with work graciously, allow you to work, as opposed to my understanding is that we are doing a job and that's benefiting them. Also, for women and loads of marginalized groups, work is a given already, so you don't really need like a, a, some kind of grace to bestow it upon you. So let's talk about gendered aspects of work. Petra, you have mentioned that you have studies, uh, studied um, buildings themselves and architecture as a built environment in Bratislava. And you have in passing mentioned to me that, oh, housing projects are a big part of the problem. I, I created an exhibition uh, called Liberated Space Care Architecture Feminism in Bratislava, where we brought all these questions and feminist critique of uh, architecture environment. Uh, it's the post communist uh, country or countries now, but country before, like Czechoslovakia, with specific gender policy also of gender policy during this that time. But there is like more layers we can follow. One of, the, of them is like uh, this, this uh, gender policy itself. The um, uh, Czechoslovak government also wanted to make uh, or to, to, to really make a real equality between men and women um, in, in laws and also in constitutions, it was, it was, which was really successful, I, I think, like theoretically. <laughs> and what, one of these goals was also to really uh, uh, to make new institutions who would uh, take care of these tasks connected with household, but it wasn't successful, you know. After 68, the, the gender policy became to be more conservative, 
than at the beginning. And also like the cultural notion of women as a carer became to be more important. You can see it also visually that the representation of women changed, you know, as a begin at the beginning as a workers em empowered women, you know, in the different uh, uh, I don't know, uh, work positions, and then mostly uh, carers with children or even servants, I would say, you know. <laughs> I would like to come back to you, Peter. I should say that the heritage of the Soviet experiment in workers' self-advocacy, from a superficial point of view, which is mine, it seems that the Soviet experiment has appropriated the antics and, and the slogans of the workers' movement and built a pretty horrific empire in its name with big social improvements, nevertheless an authoritarian empire. And this often is the first thing that comes to a lot of people's minds when we talk about labor. Oh, you're a communist, you want to go to the Soviet Union. How does this, uh, does this cultural heritage or this superficial impression check out in your experience? And how can this maybe be overcome? The Soviet Union and, um, first of all, the Stalinism and the terror of Stalinism in the 1930s uh, uh, absolutely discredited the utopia, uh, the, the, the socialist uh, utopia. Uh, among uh, the Western intellectuals, uh, after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, the crackdown of the Prague uh, uh, Spring in 1968, Many uh, many achievements, which was a result of the of the um, struggle of the labor movement. For instance, uh, yes, uh, the eight hour workday, the social insurance, which was introduced the eighteen nineties in the Wilhelmian Germany. The German conservative political elite feared uh, the labor movement. They introduced uh, many many social uh, um, measurements. Uh, in order to avoid a kind of revolution. And uh, uh, now uh, you are sitting in the library. In Hungary, uh, the most important uh, uh, library organizer was uh, Erwin Szabó. And uh, Erwin Szabó uh, wanted uh, uh, to spread uh, the knowledge among the proletarians in order to make them conscious about their rights. The public libraries, I think, uh, one of the, the, the most important uh, results of the labor movement. Let's talk a little bit about, or a lot, about labor mobility, because this is a huge issue. This is a rallying cry now across all political sides, especially across Europe uh, and, and the North American political discourses. Europe seems to be struggling with a labor shortage and getting more and more restricted on immigration. What the heck is up? Yes, that's a contradiction. That's, that's an extreme politically driven contradiction, I would say. The problem now is that you simply, it's not just that you cannot find the workers to, to fill the job, you cannot find the right worker to fill the job. How Europe used to deal with that problem since uh, a few decades at least is that they used to, at least the Western Europe, Central Western Europe, let's say, or the old European member states, they used to um, yeah, import workers from the new European member states. And migration as per se is a very complex issue on when you think uh, from the societal point of view, right? Yeah, because they, they season their food and that's going to end Western society. Yes, absolutely. So Eastern Europeans were used to fill in those gaps uh, in Western Europe. And that was sort of the major source for, you know, to fill in the gaps on the one hand and on the other hand to fight against the demographic decline because this is, you know, the issue which cannot be um, started in isolation because labor shortages, they are linked to the demographic decline as well. <laughs> Now, some words from today's host. We're here at the EVM Library, that is the library of the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. This is an institute of advanced study in the humanities and social sciences. The EVM Library is a public, non-lending, open-stack facility distributed throughout the institute. It began with just one bookshelf and has grown to contain around 40,000 volumes of books and periodicals over the years, hosting many archives as well. And now, <laughs> apparently talk shows. Maybe it's worth pointing out that within Europe there is a gigantic wage vacuum, 
which which mainly goes from northwest to southeast, but of course has all different trajectories. And of course, it doesn't stop at the EU border. So this is true regionally. This is a driver for migration in and of itself. But the migration, as you say, is actually necessary for economic function and core social functions. For instance, one field that's tragically understaffed is, well, care work, all kinds of care professions are incredibly understaffed all across Europe. And these people uh, taking these jobs by, by the majority tend to be migrant workers within Europe and also from uh, from outside of Europe. They tend to be so also, for instance, in the US and Canada. And this kind of care work is, um, even if it's a paid professional labor, this tends to be way underappreciated as opposed to other professions. But there is another aspect of care. We'll come back to this, but there is another aspect of care when it comes to labor. And there are, those are caring practices within labor. Can you please tell us about the aspect of care in architecture? I really appreciate the work of Mena Agha. She is a um, uh, Canada-based uh, architect and architectural historian or theorist rather with Nubian uh, origins and she also she's bringing this, uh, this term of emotional capital in architecture and she's thinking about architecture uh, also in the broader sense as something created by someone and really often by women and she is bringing this um, uh, thinking about uh, uh, care as something precious and really uh, with, with a big value uh, from the, the African cultural background. I like this uh, also cultural shift when, because in our culture care is not really so validated. So uh, to go to the, another culture and see how care is important there, it's also really, really, really good, I think. This should be the hottest topic on earth because, especially for conservatives, because beating the drums about demographic panic and, oh my God, we don't have enough babies. If care work is not appreciated and not even enabled, then how the hell do you expect us to have more children? So let's talk about this gendered aspect of the visibility of labor it, across labor history. Why do we still picture the worker, quote unquote, still predominantly as male? And why is uh, female labor not included in the stereotypical image or the usual image of labor, Peter? In the early 20th century, even in the early 20th century, the, lit the literature and the culture, the public discourse was uh, uh, full of uh, stereotypes. Uh, a story uh, came into my mind about uh, Varishka Gardos, who was uh, uh, an organizer of the Hungarian female labor movement. And uh, in her memoir, she wrote um, the tragic and sad story about uh, that she lost uh, uh, one of one of her, her children. Uh, uh, but she tried uh, to finish an article uh, for for uh, for a journal. She wrote uh, in her memoir that uh, there was a, a dead baby in the room. She had to had to finish an, an article because uh, she uh, had to take care about the other other children. Her husband uh, was Ernő Brestovsky, uh, uh, a theoretician of the Hungarian uh, labor movement, and they, uh, they, trans they translated uh, commonly uh, the international uh, uh, labor anthem. Although uh, they translated commonly uh, this, uh, this international labor anthem, it was published under the name of, of uh, Ernő Brestovsky. The Hungarian Soviet Republic was proclaimed in 1919. Uh, uh, there was not uh, uh, any uh, female socialist positions among the commissars. It was uh, absolutely uh, male, male government. Although the Hungarian Soviet Republic uh, promoted uh, the ballot, the universal ballot uh, for, for the female workers. But um, the culture was uh, absolutely uh, uh, was absolutely dominated uh, by 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 the males.
If you want to know more about European news and see what the Display Europe portal offers, and you should, check out Vox Europe's press review articles and short video recaps. The southeastern part of Europe is a preferred migration route. How do these countries manage arrivals? Claudio Pop takes a closer look in partnership with Display Europe. You should also subscribe to Display Europe's newsletter so you get updates and thematic reads from the portal. The labor movement had focused after the Industrial Revolution on wage labor and much of the labor done back then, less portion but still a significant portion of the labor performed right now are not waged labor, so not things you get paid for. Women are always worked in agricultural work, in, in uh, trades, in domestic labor, in housekeeping, and in so many other fields. So it's not like there was ever a time in history when women had not worked and done significant amounts of labor, oftentimes more than their male counterparts, not even to mention everyone not covered by these genders. Um, this is now sort of um, getting certain credit um, at least it doesn't, get, it doesn't get any credit on the legal level, but at least on the academic level you see this whole no, recently new um, strand of literature which looks into the paid versus the unpaid work and which really delves into the problem of female being um, kind of doing not just the, the, the second shift but the third shift often, you know, in the sense that one thing you work on, on the labor market, another thing you keep working at home. But the problem is that uh, all the inequalities and all the problems we see on the labor market, they are to a large extent attributed to the family processes and the family decisions. And what we see now, at least from what we see from consistently across Europe in the empirical data, is that even in the dual earner couples where both wife and husband work, even if they work full time, they work same hours, females, they would keep doing the major part of the housework, the major part of the care work whatsoever. In every single European country, even in the Scandinavian countries where the labor market is very equal, where the gender stereotypes are finally dying out, but the care work and the housework uh, in terms of the housework, in terms of the household uh, choice, it remains severely gendered across the traditional lines. And it holds across all the education groups, across all different age groups, um, ethnical background, everything. That is why we always have a jar of pickles on each and every episode of this show to commemorate the unwaged labor of pickling and everything else that my aunt, mother, and everybody else in my family do around the house. Also, this is part of my cultural heritage. Power to the when you talk about the second shift, these infrastructures like cantinas and laundries and kindergartens altogether and public education as a whole, these are all big mechanisms of lifting a lot of burden from women only. Technologies, many of them women invented uh, technologies like the washing machine, which is arguably the biggest civilization factor in our lives, if you've ever done laundry by hand, you know that. Um, or, you know, other household appliances that enable us to lift domestic work haven't yet resulted in making women obsolete, right? We still have a lot to do, and the second, third, fourth shift did not go away. Please tell me how you see um, further technologization unfolding Certainly, machines are not going to take our job. That's, I mean, they may take one job, but that would mean that we have to learn uh, to do another job. So this is the thing which now happens with the technological change and labor market is that uh, we have to learn much more, we have to learn faster, we have to have the skills which can, in terms of you know, the skill profile you need now on the labor market to be successful. It is a much, much broader tool set. It's a, it's, it's, it's a whole more that you have to learn permanently. And uh, this is the major thing which is now um, probably going to be the dominating feature of the labor market for, for the next decades is that uh, the skill demands, they are changing and they, change, they are mainly changed by the technological advancements. And the problem is that of course those effects, they are very different across the occupation groups. Because of course, for, when you think about the you know things like you know the, on the, for the professionals, for them it's not such a shocking new reality that they have to learn something new all the time. But for the other workers, the one on the you know the lower wage segment or on the you know the the, the blue scholar or semi skilled um, uh, scale of, of jobs, for them um, the impacts would be probably the most um, the most vivid because they would really need to 
not just looking for a new job with your existing skills, but going to the re-education, so getting to keep um, keep making a living. So, um, yeah, in that respect, at, at this point, uh, when, where we are right now, it's really hard to say exactly where we're going to be in 20, 30 years, but for sure, uh, the changes which are now ongoing, they would have quite a sizable implications for, for workers. Well, some jobs, they're going to be taken by the you know, computers, robots, however. Uh, but that would simply mean that the people who lost their jobs to the computers and robots, they have to get a new job. Uh, education, re-education, uh, on-the-job training, of course, um, this is something which has to be in the spotlight. So, therefore, this whole, um, this whole debate on the education and the importance of the re-education at the adult age, uh, it ha really has to be in, in the spotlight of the political decisions in that respect. Thank you so much. Thank you all, all of you, for being here with us. And if somebody wants to make a bit of a sense of this necessity of lifelong learning, I first and foremost recommend the scholarship of today's guests for reading, which is um, uh, available in various forms. And second of all, but equally as importantly, check out displayeurope.eu for content across 15 European languages and yourzine.com, the magazine presenting you this show and um, with much less superficial reads than I represent here. Thank you so much. Thank you. The program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than 100 partner publications and across dozens of European languages. This talk show is a Display Europe production, a content sharing platform that presents you content from all over Europe in 15 languages and more, and also somehow miraculously doesn't abuse your user data. I know it's a shocker. Now if you want us to have nice graphics or like, just like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash eurozine, that is eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford and get a couple of bonus materials and get to recommend us topics and questions. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, views and opinions expressed here are those of the authors and the speakers only, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACA can be held responsible for them. Although, you know, I wish they took advice from us. We also thank the Institute of Human Sciences and the EVM Library for hosting us today.